We were done, the tire was new, and we were worthy, and we ate a Pizza Hut meal and felt at once shame and great joy with our pizza. The place was empty. The day had been so long. The food was real and warm. The Pizza Hut man brought our soft drinks to us, and then refills for free. We looked like hell. We were tired, but there were only five days left now. We had started with seven days, and now we had five, four and a half. And had we used them well so far? We spent the dinner recounting the hours, the flight over, the time in Dakar, the prostitutes, the beaches, the cop, Sally, the basketball, the man by the water living in the provisional resort cottage. We're doing fine so far, I said. We have to move quicker, Han said. We'll get better organized. You think we'll make it to Cairo in time? Sure. Easy. After Mongolia, even? Sure. We've got time. I really have to get to Cairo. That's my main thing. I know. But if we head north to Moscow, we can do both, I said, not knowing a thing. The rest of the trip in my mind sped with airplane speed and hovercraft grace. More water, more air, a balloon, a zeppelin, more boats, and monkeys. And where was that wall again? The one the millions touched, set in the center of that golden square? We drove to the Gem al Fenat, past the interlocking streams of pedestrians in silhouette, a great low mountain moving against the darkening horizon, the heads of intermingling thousands. We didn't know exactly around what they were gathered, some kind of flea market. We had not been told. We parked and two boys on one bike offered to sell us hashish. We said no thanks. They begged us to buy some, we passed. Hand patted one on the back to wish them well. We walked through the square, but already while we were looking for a parking spot, the crowd had thinned. It was about 10. All the women were gone and the men were hungrier. In grumbles and whispers, 10 different sellers of hash made their presence known. We passed through them and around the monkeys handstanding by lantern light. The crowds were for the street performers and into the halls of shops. We entered and shuffled through an ever-narrowing thicket of proprietorships, separated by makeshift walls and rugs hung, vendors barking, selling sneakers, backpacks, scarves, CD players, cameras, crafts, carpets, jewels and vases, and anything one can make from silver or gold-painted tin. We stopped in a tiny enclave, manned by a small, quick-moving man with fast, small, sad eyes and great animal eyebrows. Every object we picked up or glanced at promoted a flurry of proposals and urgings. He called us his friends and offered us student rates, and put his hand on Han's back, patting it nervously. My friend, he said to me, grabbing my shoulder, you had something happen to you, so I have the thing. He retrieved a long sword, almost three feet long, curved and sheathed in an ornate case. See how nice? How much? I asked. I like the sword. For you, one hundred dollars. Hand laughed in a great burst. I moved on to smaller models. The salesman kept talking. At first we laughed when he spoke while he did the my friend, my friend, I help you out part. And then we tried to let him know that he didn't need to do the act with us. We knew better. We had the blue book and knew the real value, etc. But he continued and we had to laugh more. We bargained with him half-heartedly. We wanted a couple silly things, a pair of knives, a small jewelry box, oval and stubbed with fake emeralds, which broke apart and became a bracelet. And we pretended to leave when he would not take our offer. He sighed. He looked around left and right and behind a burgundy curtain to make clear that if he gave us this price, he had to do so out of earshot of his boss or God. Out of appreciation for his efforts and great camaraderie and fortitude, we bought from him five things, two decorative knives, two of the small jewelry boxes, and finally a small tin plate engraved. See you, my friends, he said to our backs when he realized we were leaving. You want nice chess set? For you, beautiful student trait. But we were gone and had more elaborate plans. We walked back into the square and looked for a new merchant alley. But we had wasted too much time. Most of the shops were now closed. Their metal gates had come down, or their proprietors were packing up. No, there's one. On the outskirts of the square, a large shop was still open. Just an open garage, really, but bright and full to the ceiling, 16 feet up. In front of it, a stray dog foraged through an enormous pile of garbage and human waste. We greeted the portly store owner as we stepped up and among the bright overcrowded shelves of dishes and rugs and boxes, platters and knives. It was this store in its tins and brasses, blues and reds so bright, enamel on tin toys, more ravishing than almost any painting I'd ever seen or had likely ever been made. 
It was an intricate medieval tapestry and a hundred perfect Dutch still lifes together melded but brighter lit. The accumulated care and craft put into these objects, each bauble, was surely equal to almost anything more celebrated artists had done or could do, as is any aisle in any grocery store, as is any decent toy shop, but these places would never be recognized as such, nor would a casino so. Among the tea sets and chess sets and tiny chests for special things, I looked for and found the smallest, cheapest, and least desirable item the store held. It was a keychain anchored to a small white animal, probably a sheep, crudely carved from a smooth milky material looking like lucite. I held it, I caressed it, I presented it to hand, posing as my knowledgeable dealer in precious objects, with a rumble of approval. He came to me and touched it and purred his interest. It's incredible, I said. It's almost painful, he said. Our interest was made clear. We turned to the portly man and asked him, in French, how much. He spoke no French. He scurried to a desk in the back and returned with a lined piece of paper, folded to a fourth. On it he wrote, 60 dirham. 60 dirham, about three dollars. I looked at the paper, then at the keychain. I frowned. I shook my head slowly. This is where the trick would come in. I asked for the paper and pen. He handed them to me and on his paper, under his 60 dirham, I wrote, 150 dirham. Then I gave it back in a stern but hopeful way. At that moment, many things could have happened. He could have burst out laughing, getting the joke, thinking the joke funny. Or he could have scratched his head, briefly bewildered, then pointed out my mistake. There was also the possibility, odds not too small, that by reversing the forces of bargain logic, we were pulling on the universe's loose threads, and by doing so might unravel everything from money to love, to the double helix, tremors felt from Bombay to Akureyri. But none of these things happened. What happened is that the man looked at the paper, cocked his head a moment, squinted, then nodded his head once quickly. Okay, he said, grimacing. It was a deal. We had taxed his patience, but a hard bargain had been won. He was a fair man. Hand stepped closer. I showed Hand the paper and indicated that this good man had agreed to my hard-driven terms. Hand, though, was not to be so easily satisfied. He asked to hold the sheep keychain. I put it in his palm. He held it and weighed it in his hand. He ran a finger along its length. He examined closely the keyring, clicking it open and shut as if fidgeting with the carabiner. Then he shook his head and took the pen and the paper, and under the 60 dirham, and under the 150 dirham he wrote, 250 dirham. Here I thought we might have gone too far. The man would laugh, the man would see the gag. Not a chance. Instead, again, the man took a long hard look at the proposal, fist to chin, and slowly agreed with a slow nod. My knees were shaking. I took the sheep again. Now I held it to my face and rubbed it. I kissed it softly and looked into its tiny black eyes. The price was not right. 250, I said to hand. That's an insult. I took the paper from hand and wrote under it, 1,800 dirham. I handed it back to the salesman, at this point truly expecting him to throw up his hands and laugh. We were insisting on paying about $120 for a keychain priced at three. But the man didn't flinch. He was a titan. He touched a finger to his mouth, either gauging our sanity or pretending to maul our newest offer, and after a long, perfect pause, again acquiesced. I was having probably the best time I could remember ever having, but Han turned to the man, shook his head and said, good, and paid him. It was over.